All right, in the last segment, we were talking about the land Sabbaths that fell into the 390 years of sin for Israel and the 40 years of sin for Judah. And then we detailed where those years actually came in the chronology. Now we're going to move forward to the Babylonian exile. Before we do that, let's go back here to the first year of Nebuchadnezzar. Here's Nebuchadnezzar's reign in the blue column. Okay, and I have the first year of his reign drawn right here. Now the Babylonians began all of their regnal years on a spring basis. So the year of the world column over here on this side, these years are from the spring equinox to the spring equinox. Okay, and the Babylonians always nearly always calculated their new moons after the spring equinox. Although early in Nebuchadnezzar's reign, some of the months are actually calculated before the spring equinox. Now, this first column here is a standard Babylonian method of calculating their years. Sometimes the method of calculating used a fall epoch. The Book of Kings does this. All right. Now, dating things in terms of the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar is a new phenomenon in biblical chronology that doesn't occur anywhere else in the chronology before this point. And that is taking a pagan or foreign king and dating events in terms of the foreign kings. Before this point, the scriptural chronology has all been built internally on numbers of the pre-flood patriarchs, post-flood patriarchs, and the judges and kings of Israel. Never before in the chronology has a foreign king been used to build the chronology. Not only that, but the scripture simply states what year in terms of the foreign king that events happened. Like for instance, in the seventh year of Nebuchadnezzar, Okay, for the Babylonian exile in Jeremiah 52, 28. So there's no anchor points in the biblical chronology for the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Now the question is, why does the scripture depart from giving all the reigns of all, why, why doesn't it give us all the data on all the Babylonian kings and link it exactly in world history where it is? And the reason that the scripture does this is because the scripture is telling us that the Babylonian regnal chronology can be relied on. In other words, it wouldn't be used if it wasn't accepted as to when these kings world, ruled in world history. Now, the scripture never uses Assyrian dates or... Egyptian dates or any other dates to date any events in scripture except this Babylonian chronology and later on we'll find out that it uses Persian and Roman chronology and skips right over Greek chronology. And if you ask chronologers you'll find out you'll find out that certain periods of world history the chronology is floating and uncertain. It's a relative chronology. And you'll find out that other periods are exact, and there's no, there's no dispute on when the, when the chronology should be. All right. The first period of world chronology that is ex accepted as absolute by chronologers and historians, secular and religious right, is the Neo-Babylonian chronology. Assyrian chronology is uncertain and floating. Egyptian chronology is uncertain and floating. Outside the biblical chronology, the first secular period of chronology to be absolute is Neo-Babylonian chronology. And hence, that is the reason why the Bible uses it. The scripture would not use it if it wasn't trustworthy. You come down further to the Greek period, Greek chronology is uncertain to plus or minus one or two years in some parts. The scripture never dates anything in terms of 
Greek chronology of the Ptolemies or the Seleucids. It refers to them in the book of Daniel, but it never gives any dates in terms of those kings. Then it gets down to the Roman emperors. Roman chronology is uncertain before 40 BC and the time of Augustus Caesar. And we find that the scripture uses Roman chronology only in a period in which it can be, it is certain and trustworthy, namely the reign of Tiberius Caesar. And of course, the Roman chronology till modern times, on a year-by-year -year basis, there is no doubt about which year was meant in the chronologies of, of Rome and Europe up to the present day. So when the scripture actually condescends to use a pagan date, so-called, then we can trust that that pagan date is reliable. It doesn't, give, it doesn't give us all the information or reasons why it's reliable, it just assumes that it's reliable. All right. The first year of Nebuchadnezzar was in 604 B.C. and lasted to 603 B.C., Nisan 1. Now I have this little book here called Babylonian Chronology. 626 B.C. to A.D. 75 by Richard A. Parker and Waldo H. Duberstein. Okay, and if we flip over here, they have some neat little charts in this book. Right here. Nebuchadnezzar II, that's the Nebuchadnezzar of the Scriptures. Then here we have in the first column, his first year, 604, and then they have the date, 4-2, or April 2nd. That would be the date of the first day of the month of Nisan. And then they have all the months of the year over to, there was an Adar, no, there's just an Adar in this year. Adar began on February 21st, over here. And then the next year, 603 B.C., his second year began on March 22nd. Okay, now the question is, is how can scholars be so certain that the Babylonian chronology is accurate to these dates? And we go back to the beginning of this book here, and we get some clues as to why this is. If we look at the reign of Nebuchadnezzar here, they're citing different evidence here. For a six-month, or Ilulu II in its second year, unpublished text, so on, eclipse text. British Museum 38462. And then they give other sources that this is described in. A British Museum number refers to a tablet that they found, archaeologists found. Eclipse text will refer to the fact that the tablet mentions an eclipse. All right, if we go over here to his fifth year, we see that we have another eclipse text and the reference in the British Museum tablet. If we go down to, let's say, unpublished texts, there's economic texts. Here's another eclipse text. Okay, and let's see, we'll find another eclipse text. Here's another eclipse text. Okay, in the first year of Nergal, one of Nebuchadnezzar's successors. All right, and the reason that they're so certain about this is because they have all of these astronomical observations and using the theories of Newton and modern astronomical calculation they can go back in time and figure out exactly when these chronologies should be. Now there are actually two witnesses to this. There's modern computer calculation of the observations in the text and there's also historical sources. One of them is called Ptolemy. He was a great astronomer and he wrote a uh, work called the Almagest in which he detailed the beginnings of the reigns of the Babylonian and the Persian kings. And the Almagest actually agrees with the second witness of back calculating astronomical observations. We also have one other very important astronomical observation. If we go down here to 568, right here, okay, in the 37th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, which actually 
if we look here, the 37th year will span Nissan and 568 to Nissan and 567. We have an astronomical text called VAT Astronomical Text 4956. And the VAT stands for Venus Astronomical Text, which plots the positions in the heavens of several planets on a given day, which astronomers can retrocalculate. This was dated to the 37th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar and serves to locate his reign absolutely in terms of the AC and the BC system. Okay, we also have another astronomical observation for the, for the, um, the reign of Cyrus, the first Persian king to reign over Babylon. The, ta the tablet's called, um, let's see here, this tablet describes the seventh year of Cambyses and various, okay, this is actually the second, well, Cambyses. Back up here. Darius the Mede, Cyrus. Cyrus is a throne name, okay, so Cambyses is the second Persian king to reign over Babylon. Okay, so the seventh year of Cambyses, we have another tablet. We have, coming down to the reign of Artaxerxes, in the year 454, 453, his 11th year, we have a text called VAT 5047, Venus Astronomical 5047. This also locks down the reign of Artaxerxes. So we know this chronology exactly and absolutely there's no dispute from secular history about when this is. Now, different groups before the beginning of the ninth, before the beginning of the 20th century had different chronological theories to support their um, their speculations. For instance, the Jehovah's Witnesses under um, Taze Russell had a chronological system that can no longer be defended because of these archaeological results and astronomical retrocalculation. Also, the Mormons had theories about ancient chronology that can no longer be defended. And of course, there are always groups and people who are speculating in chronology and they are ignoring the astronomical results and they are ignoring the archaeological results. All right. I want to go back and talk about Assyrian chronology here and what happened to biblical chronology after about 1940. Let's see here. Okay. Going back to the reign of Hezekiah here. It's an important biblical synchronism here in the between the reign of Hezekiah, the first king of Judah to reign after the exile of the northern kingdom, and the last king of Israel of the northern kingdom named Hosea. Okay, and that is that in 2 Kings 18, 9, it says that it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hosea, the son of Elah, the king of Israel. So we have this synchronism. The fourth year matches, the fourth year of Hezekiah matches the seventh year of Hosea. And then we have another synchronism down here in 2 Kings 18.10 where the ninth year of Hosea matches the sixth year of Hezekiah. So we see the sixth year of Hezekiah is equaling the ninth year of Hosea. And what happened after 1940 was that um, a Seventh-day Adventist chronologer named Edwin Teeley decided that he would disregard the synchronism in favor of Assyrian chronology. And he was preceded by a chronologer named Leslie F McFall. And they departed from the results of Martin Ansey and David Cooper and decided that um, the Assyrian dates were sound and that the scriptural dates were unsound. They actually had to reject the synchronism. And what they ended up doing... Okay, I'm going to end the segment. We'll have to continue in the next part.